this job. So generally, this chapter. Um, first of all, I'm interested in this chapter for a number of reasons. One is because I'm a disability rights activist. I'm a scholar. I'm a disabled self advocate, and I'm also very much interested in advancing rights of people with disabilities uh, in the United States and, of course, first of all, in Kenya. I usually conduct accessibility and survey in various places and spaces by the virtue of my disability. And I always collect data through observations and surveys and interactions with people with and without disability, generally to understand environments. And I mainly focus on public spaces and places for a number of reasons, because those spaces determine inclusivity of people with disability. Uh, when I go to private homes, I don't care very much just because everyone has a right of their places. Uh, I also emphasize these public spaces for a number of reasons. One is because they determine uh, the post school outcomes and the quality of life of people with disabilities. So we know very well that participation in labor or employment, participation in community, community uh, activities for leisure and recreation or even for secondary education, all are very much influenced by accessibility. So I'm very much interested in environments and how those environments does influence inclusion, belonging, and participation of people with disabilities in the community affairs. Now, in this chapter, I did use different methods to collect data. First of all, I used both the Kenyan data and then international data and personal experiences and surveys that I did with people with disabilities, and of course, as any other photoethnographic research I also reflected on most of the things that I was, most of the data that I was collecting as a form of triangulation. Now, in this chapter, I stress the need to attend to disability within the broader model of equity. And in fact, as I will mention later on, I see equity itself as problematic and very, um, very limited in its description of participation of people with disabilities in the community. Now, in summary, in this chapter, I'm examining the interactions of disability and transportation system. And it's because I'm very much interested in the empowerment of people with disabilities. And uh, I'm very much interested in, in the transportation system for a number of reasons. In Kenya, what happened is that in 2003, after the election of the new, after the installation of the new president, they embarked on massive transportation um, uh, uh, infrastructural development. And what happened is that billions of dollars have been borrowed, mostly from international partners, uh, World Bank, IMF, and mostly from China, uh, which doesn't require a lot of collateral uh, signing. And like, let's say, US sometimes it demands human rights. Uh, for them to be given laws. So my question in this chapter was, what's the rights and responsibilities of people with disabilities? So that's the main reason why I'm very much interested, but because the, the whole idea is that Kenya is signatory to the United Nations and is very much interested in the 2030 vision, which is poverty eradication. So I'm interested with this investment in infrastructure, where is Kenya? positioning people with disabilities within the broader structure of citizenship. My argument throughout the paper is that Kenya has embraced uh, the rhetorics of disability rights, but it's still not doing the best when it comes to citizenship of uh, disabled people. So what we are experiencing per se per now, from my perspective, is that there is the citizenship of Kenyans with disabilities based on the concept of Prince's ideas of uh, the citizenship theory. Thanks. That's all right. Is everybody on the ride online? Sorry. <laughs> um, so I would just highly recommend, for those of you who are in the room, I have a couple of copies of the book here. Um, and so what Dr. Russell mentioned was this sort of mixing of critical disabilities 
studies and autoethnography. And so there's some really interesting photo collage that are used in this chapter that if you are here and have the ability to look through them, um, or if you want to purchase the book for those of you online, um, I highly encourage you to look at that really sort of innovative approach. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> um, I will take a look at it as the next person speaks. Thank you so much. All right, so our next speaker uh, is Dr. Priska Taurus, who is a lecturer and head of the Department of Psychology, Counseling, and Education Foundation at Lycopia University. Thank you so much. I am speaking to you from Kenya, Nakuru County. I am so grateful to be in uh, this particular conversation this evening. Uh, at our place here, it, it is 8.53 uh, p.m. So um, I am presenting a paper on um, the psychosocial economic challenges of parents of children with disabilities and their psychological well-being. This was a paper that was done as a research paper with um, my two colleagues, uh, Dr. William Kurume and Stephen Ngososei. This paper was done as a research paper in Wasingishu County. Um, Kenya is divided into county. And so this paper was done um, and um, we were interested in um, looking at the psychosocial and economic uh, challenges of parents, um, of parents with children with disabilities. So um, we were looking at uh, 24 parents both male and female, who are taking care of children with disabilities. Our interest was um, that in the constitution of Kenya, which was, uh, uh, which was put in place in 2010, it emphasizes on the rights of people with disabilities. Uh, so we were interested in looking at now that uh, this particular constitution is in place, the, 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 other the other laws and regulations for people with disabilities are also in place, then how far is it that these people with disabilities, especially children, are benefiting and how are their parents being supported? now that they are taking care of very important people, citizens of, the, of, of this nation. So we went out to carry out a, a, a research um, and we used the method of snowball um, type of sampling where one parent was leading us to another parent who was taking care of their children with disabilities. And so the findings of this research uh, we believe are going to inform um, legislatures, uh, policy makers, non-governmental organizations, and other stakeholders who are dealing with people with disabilities. So um, it was therefore found out that um, the parents of children uh, with disabilities have several challenges including poor access of their children to health care, low school attendance, um, limited employment rates for their children who have completed school, and several others. Apart from um, that, we also found out that uh, in spite of um, the national disability policy, which was put in place in 2006, and also the constitution of Kenya, which was promulgated in 2010, it was supposed to provide uh, people with disabilities uh, with capacity building, creating conducive working environment, 
and uh, preparing or bringing out an operating environment for these people. But um, the study found out that um, most of these, though they are in place, they are uh, barely um, implemented. So um, the people that were involved in the study were 24 parents. There were 10 male, 14 female, and their ages was, um, they were ranging from 30 years to 69 years. And uh, so our concern was, we wanted to know um, the knowledge existing on uh, policies uh, regarding people with disabilities. We wanted to know how are the parents aware about that. So the policies that we looked at were the universal education for children, children's services in Kenya, Children's Disability Act, Constitution of Kenya, and so forth. We therefore realized that uh, the majority of the parents were not so much aware of these services, and therefore they did not benefit on them because they were not, they did not benefit from them because they were not aware. So the challenges that these parents experienced uh, were included the, the, uh, this I'm going to mention, but not limited to that. Uh, they included neglect, which were, which the parents perceived they were neglected by the public. They were left alone when they were facing any danger like sickness or death of a loved one and so forth. They also did not uh, get medication unless if they paid for it, they were misunderstood. The friends kept off from them and they also did not get help from people even when they needed it. So other challenges included the psychological challenges where the parents of these children experienced uh, discrimination even when they went to hospital with a child with, dis, uh, with disability, many of the government uh, workers uh, many times discriminated against them. And they even attended to other children who are ordinary children uh, and left these other uh, children who are living with disability. So we also were interested in knowing how are these parents coping and we realized that uh, the coping strategies these parents had put in place was one, they were sharing responsibilities that is between husband and wife. They also were working together with the extended family. In some cases where they were able to pay, they employed a caretaker. And sometimes they just adapted that particular situation for them to live in peace. And many times those that had been employed would keep themselves away from duty. And uh, the, because of all that, they faced psychological challenges. Uh, and uh, some of the psychological challenges which they experienced were isolation, frustration, and stigmatization. And because of this, some of the family social fabrics were broken you would find that a, a, a husband had ran away, leaving the wife alone with the child with a disability and vice versa. So our conclusions and recommendations were as follows. Um, in Kenya, we are making a recommendation that daycare centers should be established to reduce the cost of caring for children with disabilities by the parents alone, but the government should support. Again, parents of children with disabilities should be exempted from paying taxes because as we say, even today, they pay taxes like any other person. And uh, knowing that they always take care of a child with a disability, which is very expensive for them, then we are recommending that the government should come in to support. Uh, other recommendations is that uh, social groups for these parents should be um, established to enable them to have psychosocial support and uh, peer to peer support. 
There should also be follow-up support programs for children with disability, because at the moment in Kenya, some stipend of uh, um, 2,000 Kenya shillings is given to a child with a disability um, for their upkeep. But you realize that many of the children with a disability are not registered because parents are still stigmatized. And so they do not bring their children to the public. Hence, they do not register them. So they do not even benefit from the little amount that is set for them. And therefore, our recommendation is parents of children with disabilities should be economically empowered through capacity building and uh, through being exempted from taxes. And even that stipend should be increased. Uh, up to that point, those were our recommendations and our findings. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarus. Um, I, I, I think that your, your study touches on so many different things. It touches on the sort of failures of policy, it touches on the social cultural factors, it touches on you know, financial factors. Um, and I just think it's a really kind of rich uh, a study in addition to the book. Uh, so next up, we have Dr. Arlene Cantor, who is the Laura J. and L. Douglas Meredith Professor of Teaching Excellence and the Bonds, Sean F. And King, Distinguished Professor of Law at Syracuse University. Thank you, Becca. All right. Thank you. Back. Thank you, Becca. And thank you, Nina, and my fellow, fellow contributors and all of you there. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm thrilled to be here with you today as I was to contribute to the volume. Right now, I'm in Syracuse, New York, where it has just begun to snow for the first time this year. And that's something I never saw in my time in Kenya. Our chapter, which I co-authored with my former student, uh, who is now a women's and disability rights activist and advocate in Nairobi, Evelyn Milanoi Koya, we discuss in our chapter violence against girls and women with disabilities in Kenya. We discuss what the research shows about the prevalence of such violence, why it often goes unreported, and the role of law, both international law and Kenyan law, in addressing this critical social issue. You may know that women and girls with disabilities face double discrimination as women and as people with disabilities. And the UN General Assembly itself has recognized that women and girls with disabilities are among the most, quote, vulnerable and marginalized in the world. For them, violence can be physical, also psychological, sexual, financial, including neglect, social isolation, entrapment, degradation, detention, denial of education and health care, involuntary sterilization, and involuntary treatment. The research also shows that violence against women with disabilities in Kenya and elsewhere is often perpetuated by stereotypes about them, which attempt to dehumanize them, infantilize them, exclude them, and isolate them. They become targets for sexual and other forms of violence. In Kenya, where the studies that um, Illinois had done and others that we reviewed, we found that most abuse of women and girls with disabilities is committed by family members or others known to the disabled girl or woman and within their own homes. Such abuse often goes unreported. Kenyan studies have found that families who are aware of such abuse choose not to report it. And when women themselves want to bring this to others' attention, women with disabilities, they're often afraid to report it or to even tell their family members if it's their caretaker or someone they know. For these women and their families who do report acts of violence, they face numerous barriers in their efforts to access justice. They're often not believed or they're denied legal capacity. In Kenya, as elsewhere, women with intellectual disabilities in particular are denied legal capacity, which means they're not even considered persons under the law. They can't bring any actions because they have no right to be appearing in the justice system. So as elsewhere, we found that girls and women with disabilities are at greater risk of violence. They experience more serious abuse and over a longer period of time than do women without disabilities. And the situation exists despite many international domestic laws, right? Since 1970, 1979, we've had the Convention 
on the elimination of discrimination against women, which makes it clear that violence is prohibited. More recently, we have the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities that's been signed by most every country in the world, including Kenya, that specifically prohibits abuse, abuse and exploitation of disabled girls and women and guarantees their right to access justice. That means for those women with intellectual disabilities, for example, who may not understand what happened to them, they're entitled to assistance, support, reporting the crime and throughout the court process. However, as Mill and I and I argue in our chapter, the only way that these international laws will have any effect or impact is through the development and implementation of domestic legal protections and perhaps even as important or more changes in attitudes in Kenya. Yeah. On that yeah. front, Kenya is making progress, but much more needs to be done. Kenya's new constitution adopted in 2009 affirms the right of all Kenyan citizens to justice. Kenyon also adopted several, several domestic laws, which you can read about in the chapter. I don't have time to talk about here, but they're very important because for the first time, one of them recognizes domestic abuse as a crime for the first time in Kenya. However, based on our review of the laws, practices, and studies, we concluded that unless and until the government takes violence against disabled men and women, disabled women and girls more seriously and allocates the funds necessary for such programs to support them, while focusing also on preventing violence in the first instance, violence will continue, and that's unacceptable. Women's organizations and disability rights and justice organizations are working to change negative attitudes and the stigma about disabled people generally in Kenya. And they must continue to work together and with the state to raise awareness about the need to stop violence and ensure access. While legislators and police and judges too should use their influence, we argue, Kenyans, individual Kenyans, must stand up and demand an end to violence as well against all girls and women with disabilities, including all women and girls, including those with disabilities. Thank you very much. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Ginter. Um, and thank you to, to Villanue, your co author, who couldn't be with us today. Um, I think that the, the contribution of this chapter really is to make those connections between international law and national law and local law, right, and, and the ways in which there are many gaps in, in those systems. Uh, thank you so much. And so our next chapter presentation is Jacqueline Ndugui, who is a television producer and project lead for integrating disability rights into journalist training in Sub-Saharan Africa at Internews Network, and Dr. John Mugula, who is a senior lecturer at Morangay University of Technology in Kenya. Okay, thank you so much. I will start up uh, the discussion. Our chapter was Children with Disabilities in Kenyan Media, Lessons from Able Differently Show. I, we co-authored with Dr. John Davula, who will be speaking shortly after me. So in this book chapter, we were looking at Able Differently. Able Differently is a disability-specific show on KBC Channel One. KBC is the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, the public broadcaster. It has a disability-specific program. And we were interested in looking at how children are being represented in the media through the eyes of Able Differently. So, and we have so much interested about children being represented in the media because media is there mirror of the society. If we don't have people with disability being represented in the media, then the society don't really need to know if people with disability exist, mm -hmm. the challenges they face, and how, and even how to help persons with disabilities. And through research, we found out that uh, media for a very long time has neglected persons with disabilities. And when they represent persons with disabilities, the representation is of maybe heroic, or just uh, uh, representing persons with disabilities as people who cannot be able to do anything. Uh, the stereotypes are like uh, people who are unable, the uh, evil spirits. Those are some of the 10 stereotypes by uh, a researcher known as Paul Hunt. So we are looking at that. So through the Able Differently show, we used the mixed methodology method whereby we interviewed the producers of the program, the presenters, and even the reporters of the show. And then we, are, we also analyzed the show using the content analysis. And what we were looking at, we were looking at how, how 
how Ebo differently framed the stories? How, how is the tone of the program? How do they name people with disabilities? Who are the source, the people speaking in the program, and which language specifically is being used in that program? So in our findings we, and the conclusions that we, we found out that although the public broadcaster, which is Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, had succeeded in, in crafting a program that is specific, uh, is disability specific, the study revealed that the patterns that uh, diversity and inequality was somehow lacking. This includes the public broadcasting sufficient effort to increase diversity in, of the content being featured. The diversity in the language featured in the program, which increases access to the program content, like uh, sign language interpretation, some of it was lacking. However, there was code switching, which may also disadvantage consumers of the program who are not well endowed with English and Kiswahili. Nevertheless, there was significant effort made to provide subtitles and sign language to increase access to the media content. There was also little human diversity since the males account for the majority of those who are speaking in the program with little diversity in terms of age. We noted that the public broadcaster had made insufficient effort to grant the voice of children in the program. We the, so some of the recommendations we came up with is that the program grants sufficient voice to the children, especially in inclusive learning environment, because of the sheer potential that such portrayals have on the psyche of children with disabilities, as well as adults who may tend to discriminate against children with disabilities. So the media ought to be more spirited in highlighting the issues that contribute to exclusion and stigmatization of children with disabilities. And since Able Differently is the only disability specific program in Kenya, we recommended that we have uh, more disability specific programs in Kenya featuring children, children with disabilities to be produced across the media organization in Kenya. And that maybe will in increase the representation of children with disabilities in Kenya. Thank you. I welcome Dr. Ndabula. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for that uh, very elaborate uh, brief about our program. Now, um, uh, just a brief take on this. When I met Jacqueline, uh, she was the producer of this television program called Able Differently. And I thought it was such a wonderful model because I was a lecturer from, you know, the academia and, uh, you know, teaching media students on how to, uh, you know, become reporters in the society and so on. So I thought the model that was adopted in this program was really nice. And, uh, you know, therefore I wanted to, you know, collaborate with her on this project just to study this program and see, you know, this model that's offering, uh, you know, portray of disability in a very contextual, you know, uh, African Kenyan setting uh, with this backing of international law, uh, regional law, uh, national law, and all these backed up with, uh, you know, the, the media policy. And therefore, I wanted us to find out from this program, what are some of the lessons that we, we can learn from the way this program is produced that can be replicated across Kenya, maybe across the region, and even uh, across uh, Africa. And uh, some of the you know, lessons we learned was that, although this was even a good program, there was lack of sufficient diversity in the, in the, in the, in the, in the context um, of this mm -hmm. program. Uh, we also learned that, uh, you know, uh, there's these issues of protecting the privacy of, 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 of children, uh, which needs to be taken care of, and also the pro production of more such uh, uh, programs. And this even offered me an insight as a lecturer, and I began in the several universities I've taught since then, to actually bring out a curriculum on disability reporting. And uh, when this disability reporting was included in these curriculums, I was excited because with the publication of this book, then we have resources that we can use to teach you know, in class. So my recommendation is for universities that are offering uh, disability, especially in Kenya, to actually think about you know, buying this book and using it because scholars, no policy makers and activists. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Becca. I'm sorry I'm in a remote part of uh, Kenya, Kisumu, in the planta sugar plantations. And so electricity has not quite gone there. So we are using uh, solar panels for, for lighting and then running and the computer. So I will be, I, I will highlight, just give highlights of uh, the chapter that I worked on, on uh, disability, and social justice, uh, persons with disabilities, and the quest for inclusion and constitutional reforms in Kenya. Uh, in that chapter, I, I, I bring out the genesis of activism, both for reforms generally in Kenya, but also in terms of the quest for inclusion for persons with disability in public life. And by public life in this case, I, I am not limiting it to uh, holding of public office. I'm using public life broadly to include the policy environment, the legislative environment, and administrative environment that is in place to assure and guarantee that persons with disabilities are e effectively participating in the governance of Kenya. Uh, I highlight the fact that in my experience as an activist in the struggle for reforms in Kenya, there is always a nexus between academia and those of us who are practicing ad activists, if you, if you if I may call it that. Uh, because in the, in the end, for example, the constitution movement or reform movement to focus on that was greatly influenced by the university, the university community, uh, where, for example, as a student leader, we interacted with people like uh, Dr. William Tunga, we interacted with Dr. Kimani Njogu. And in that process, we got introduced into the theory of reforms and change, which then, after we left the university, we then put into practice. So that nexus remained and continues to this day, uh, because, for example, when we started the movement on the constitutional reform, it was the academia that framed the the, the, the constitutional question for us, and then together with the lawyers they were able to put in place the, the, the legislation that eventually guided the, the constitutional reform to date. Now, because of that, as an activist, first of all, and then a person with a disability, I at some point got conflicted because then which one comes should come first? Is it the constitutional reform or is it the quest for inclusion of persons with disability. We deliberated on this with many colleagues and we came to the conclusion that we fight, first of all, for a broader democratic space for Kenya. And then once that is done, then we find our space as persons with disability. And in that process, we never lost sight of the fact of the, the citizenship of persons with disability in Kenya. And so that, is, that is how I have framed it in there. Secondly, the, the paper, the chapter looks at what are the policy environments that exist and to what extent do we find these policies uh, give, being given life? The truth of the matter is that, and I, I have made clear, give, given examples, is that uh, there is still to this date a disconnect between 
policy intention and actualization of those intentions. Uh, we have the, uh, as, as my colleagues here have stated, we have the persons with disabilities policy, which was formulated in 2006. Yes. Then in 2010, we have the, the, the new constitution, which is very uh, broad and uh, very progressive. And for the first time, acknowledges the issues of persons with disabilities in, uh, in Article 54. Yet the policy which was done in 206, there has been an attempt to review it, but that review has not been concluded to date, which means the constitutional principles of social justice that is found in our the preamble to the constitution has not been given effect. And therefore, it, it explains the sluggish manner towards realization of the fullest rights of persons with disability in Kenya. Now, we have kept pushing, and I made mention of the fact that we are pushing for the reform of the, the 2203 um, law, uh, Persons with Disabilities Act. Yes, we have been able to succeed in that by offering as part of our strategy alternative uh, legal framework or pro um, prototype legislation. We have pushed to the extent that now, before these elections of this year, the, the current Persons with Disabilities Bill Act, sorry, is in the process of being overhauled, one, to, 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 uh, to comply with the Constitution, to conform with the Constitution of Kenya, two, to comply with the international norms and standards here represented by the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And three, of course, Kenya is uh, as recently signed on to the African Union Disability Optional Protocol. So this has given us a uh, opportunity to, to, to push. Now, what, do I, what am I saying here? When I mentioned the convention, when I mentioned the African Union uh, Optional Protocol on Disability, I'm saying that in our struggle for inclusion, we never only relied on existing municipal or local legislation or local pieces of uh, policy, but we, we leveraged on Kenya's being a state party to the UN Convention, for example. Kenya being a state party to, to, the, to the political inclusion of personal disability, which is, which is just a, a declaration, but which now we used to, 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 to advocate for inclusion for persons with disabilities. Now, in terms of political representation, again, there is still some work to be done uh, because let me just give you the, the, the example of what has happened in Kenya after the 20, 20 uh, last elections in, the, on August, in August this year. Not many countries, uh, not many persons with disabilities were elected, although five of them made it through the competitive process, but then others could not do it because of the cultural issues that my colleagues there have mentioned, uh, the perception that uh, a person with disability in Kenya is not capable of performing fully the, the role of representation, uh, in public office. So not many were able to go through. But we have a mechanism, as I finish, of uh, affirmative action. And that we put this in the constitution deliberately in Article 177C. It says the county assemblies, for the county assemblies to be constitutionally constituted, it must have two persons with disability, a woman and a man. As we speak today, 21 counties do not have uh, persons with disabilities in conformity with the constitution. So what have we done? Which brings me to the next strategy, which I, I recommended in my, in my piece, the use of public interest litigation as a, as a tool 
for advocating for inclusion for persons. So we are now in court to have the Supreme Court, the High Court, sorry, declare the 21 counties as not being uh, properly constituted in accordance with the constitution. And we are praying for those countries to be dissolved until such time that they comply with the constitution. I think I will have to end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and this Kenya is a, a mighty figure in constitutional reform in the history mm -hmm. of Kenya, as well as in, in disability advocacy. And so, um, you know, the chapter that's included in the book not only includes kind of those broad issues around constitutional reform that he spoke about, but also some of his own personal story in, in working as an activist in Kenya for, for many, many years. So we're very grateful um, to have that contribution. Um, and so now I believe I'm going to turn it over to, to Dr. Jim Ferris, who's going to moderate our Q&A. Um, but right before I, I do that, I just want to recognize that there are a number of other uh, contributors to the anthology who are in the audience today. And so um, if you feel comfortable doing so, we would love to hear from you during the Q&A. Q um, and I will make sure to recognize all of you before we sign off for today. But I will pass it over to Dr. Ferris for now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Montalegon, and to the editors and all the contributors who were able to join us today. Uh, it's really a, a great thrill to be able to hear about this wonderful work and to have this volume to um, provide us with lots of insights to come. Um, we have a couple of uh, pathways that people can uh, enter into the Q&A. One of them would be to put questions into the chat function. Um, and another is they can raise their hands as well, right? If you can use the hand raising function, I'll try to keep track of both of those and uh, call on people in the order in which they raise questions. Dr. Day. Can I use the hand raising function? You can use the hand, yes, we have the actual hands as well. I'm actually just wondering, and feel free to revoice this for folks, um, what was most surprising to contributors about the collection as a whole? So what was most surprising when they actually saw the collection come together? What did it inspire? New questions, new modes of research, new ideas. Um, yeah, the most surprising thing. Great, thank you. Dr. Day asked a question. Uh, of, of all of the uh, contributors, what was the most surprising things that they discovered in the research and how that might lead to new ideas for the research, new policies, etc. Editors can also answer. Editors as well. Yes, please. So I'm curious. Uh, so one of the things that I realized once reading the book itself, because it's really, it, it, it has what I call multi-genre. So that there is multiple perspectives in it. And that itself is so much enriching. And for me, it speaks about the broader concept of disability rights movement in Kenya, but in relation to the global world. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, would you, so appreciate I'm sorry. I could also add something to this last point. That's okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, in the epilogue to the book, we have um, collected a whole bunch of questions, further research that could be done. So there is so much that um, we found that you know, this anthology is not addressing that could be the source for a number of studies. So um, I recommend just to take a look at that. Um, and there are historical questions, there are questions in terms of political mobilization. There are also questions in terms of the dis different ethnicities. I mean, Kenya has so many different languages and cultures and um, nobody really who contributed to the anthology engaged with any of those Potential differences, um, there are clearly some. I mean, whether you have a nomadic culture or an um, agricultural culture or you're in an urban setting, there are clearly different 
um, challenges and that the anthology doesn't engage with that at all. And there are many other questions. I also wanted to point out one other thing, and that is that we, when we looked at the archives of the University of Nairobi and Kenyatta University, we found hundreds and hundreds of titles of master's thesis and dissertations that focused on disability. And those titles are actually not, um, you know, not part of um, global databases, which I found is a really interesting aspect in terms of the globalization of academia. And there is this prejudice often that not enough research comes out of Africa as a continent. And when you look at these archives at the universities, you find that there is so much done and has been done for many decades. So those are things that um, in terms of what we were researching when we were writing the introduction, we found that there's so much more that needs to be acknowledged and that we can hopefully bring more to light over the um, next few decades. I mean, as a scholarly community and community of activists, I think it's hard to be a disability scholar without also being an activist. So I think this is always coming together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Are there other questions or responses to, to Dr. Neil's question? Dr. Nielsen? I would love to hear the contributors speak to the relationship between scholarship and activism. Dr. Nielsen asked for the contributors to, uh, to speak to the relationship between scholarship and activism. I think I could speak to, to that uh, briefly, if, if that's okay. And uh, also partly to answer the uh, previous question, because uh, for me coming from a purely academic background um, and, 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 and having contributed, contributed for some time to this debate on um, you know, disability, disability rights, activism, I, I found this model uh, you know, that incorporates both you know, scholars and activism together quite rich because sometimes in academia, we close ourselves off to, you know, methods that uh, perhaps are, are not very scholarly or scientific. So, it's, so it's, it was good really to have these voices together. And uh, coming from, again, media background and uh, thinking about you know training students who then become journalists in these uh, uh, you know problematic environment where disability is not really brought to the limelight it's this book offers a very good resource for um, you know uh, my students from for universities teaching disability studies because it already puts all these you know students in the you know, in the thick of things, both academic, both, uh, you know, scholarly and activism to the, together, because that's what they're going to face when they go to the, to the, to the market. So, so this is a really, really good resource in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. Can I go next? Yes, please. Okay, so for me as a media disability activist, I was just doing my job of uh, highlighting the stories of personal disability in media. But now when I started delving into research, it also expanded my horizon. So currently from the book chapter we wrote, I also got interest about children with disabilities. And now for my PhD studies, I'm doing a research on television framing of, inclus of inclusive education in Kenya in relation to children with intellectual disabilities. Because I realized we don't, uh, I wanted to find out the intersection between media, disability and inclusive education. Because that is a new paradigm. We've been having special education, integrated education, but now it is moving from that to inclusive education. But if we don't have children with disabilities being featured in the media, how do we even start talking about inclusive education? So I started researching around that so that uh, even when the government wants, when the government wants to make policy, they can go back to the research, they can go back to publications that are there, and they can be able to make uh, to make what to make to make their decision. So for me, it has been an interesting journey. 
And also currently I train journalists in Sub-Saharan Africa on how to report on people with disabilities and just to add more stories of persons with disabilities in the media. And it is through the, the some of the research that I've read and some of them being contributed by my role model here, I've seen him, I've seen her Beth Haller, a lot of representation on how media represent a person with disability in the media, it has really helped. So without research out there, even as an activist, you won't be able to really articulate your issues and even to bring these issues very well. So thank you. Thank you. I will go to Ari Cantor next. Yeah, hi, thank you. I defer to the other presenters what they just said, as I agree. And I'd only add, following up on what Nina said about the surprise, is that I too have found that there are vast pockets of research throughout the African region and through the Middle East and in Asia, where we are deprived, I would say, on the Western side of that wonderful information, innovations, creativity, and insights. And I think this book represents, I think, an important step forward in acknowledging um, scholarship, rising scholars in the field, and ways to support one another. And I hope that it'll continue. Um, I know I'm involved now in a similar effort in Middle East countries trying to support young scholars and sharing their dissertations and PhDs, their LLM degrees in law, and their other master's degrees so we can have a richer database of information that can move us forward. But I'll just say that that rich database of information in my mind is not worth the trouble unless it becomes activism. That scholarship without activism, without a commitment for social change to me is something that people can do, but I don't quite and never have quite understood the purpose. So I hope that we will continue as this book does to work together as policymakers, academics, slash activists, slash advocates, um, to bring forth data, evidence, and information, and the real lived experiences of people with disabilities themselves to make the world a better place. So it's really been a pleasure to be in this journey with all of you. Thank you. Um, to Alan next. Hello. Oh. Hello, uh, we can hear you. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, this is Alan. Eh? Yes, your response, please. Okay, uh, it's not necessarily a response, but uh, rather a question. And uh, uh, given that uh, I would like to consider myself more as uh, a younger generation in uh, disability advocacy and uh, uh, inclusion. And my question that I would like to put across the room is, uh, then how do we make sure that there is still life in advocacy work in uh, the youthful and uh, I would say Gen Zs? How do we make sure that uh, they get access to this information? Because they are totally doing advocacy and activism in a totally different way on how uh, we are doing it, or the people who uh, came before us are doing it, then how do we make them understand the history? Because it is very important to come from a place of knowing as we go into new places that have not been really interacted with. So how does the room think that, or how does the room consider how we should also involve the younger and more spirited advocates for a matter's disability, not only in the Kenyan context, but also in uh, from a global perspective. Thank you. An excellent question. And as a number of our presenters have indicated that uh, there is a greater breadth and depth to that history than is commonly recognized. So it's a really good question about how to bring that how to bring that forward, particularly to younger activists and scholars. Who would like to speak to that? Hello. Okay, so. Yeah, I've got to Go ahead. You should be okay, so I'm here. So, so uh, Alan, that question is very, it's very, it's, it's very uh, mind-boggling and uh, very 
thought-provoking at the same time, but it's very much related to my research in this paper, which is on uh, infrastructure. The only problem is that this paper did focus on infrastructure transportation before COVID-19. Otherwise, we would have looked at infrastructure, including technology itself, especially after the lockdown. Uh, access to education was very much problematic in Kenya, especially for people with disabilities and more so in the remote areas, even though international organizations like Google ended up flying a balloon with internet to enable majority of people to access internet. But nonetheless, what I've realized so far, uh, I'm responding to Alan's question about the world, is that there is increased uh, current generation uh, participating in disability advocacy uh, through mostly media. And uh, if you go to Facebook, actually, you will find disability rights activists from Kenya participating in that. Now, the question is how many of them are participating as a result of accessibility to internet and other gadgets? So that's the whole issue. We know very well that actually when it comes to mobile phones, majority of Kenyans have mobile phones. However, it's very much exhaustive when it comes to accessing the internet. Now that's where now the challenge comes in. Now, as a person with disability and a scholar and activist, uh, through education, that's what I have emphasized in every element that I teach, both here in the United States. And the research that I do in Kenya, mostly with young disabled persons, my emphasis is on activism. And that's how I'm connecting the whole idea of the new generation participating in disability awareness and questioning the government, especially when it comes to infrastructure and the money they borrow from outside. How are they investing that money in the infrastructure so that all Kenyans with disabilities participate in the welfare of the country. Just in brief. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, was there uh, uh, Sam, you could add something to that? You have a mute. Thank you. Um, you see Kiari is up next. Yes. Hello. Hi. Can y'all hear me? I don't know if I can get my video. Oh, there we go. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. This has been, I, I'm, I'm so glad I got the flyer sometime last week and managed to join today. I am here in uh, Dallas, Texas in the U.S. and originally from Kenya and I am excited. I am I'm very, very thankful for this opportunity. Let's listen through and see this. So I work for a global financial institution and I am I, I am the Autism at Work Global Lead. I have a child who's autistic and I'm also pursuing my PhD in public policy when it comes to the federal employment policies and how they affect uh, people with disabilities or employees with disabilities. Real quick, Miss Nina, I heard your intro. We worked with the Ohio State University with the Nysonga Center, where we've had autistic colleagues come uh, and intern at our, at our, at our firm. But um, so far, a lot has been said, and I want to just hone in down to the questions. I don't take much time. I've heard um, a, a, a fellow contributors on here talking talking about activism it was uh, not so much shocking but you know it, it kind of begs a question so i think it was Paddy Nyanga that talked about 21 counties not having representation a lot of activism but then how do we take that activism and influence policy changes right this you know what about representation in the sense that theo you, dr theo you talked about you brought up a good point Right, you have you can use a, a cell phone, but if you, if it's not accessible for people with disabilities, then that's a moot point. It erases the exclusion piece of it, right? Or rather, it erases the inclusion piece of it, and these individuals are are excluded. And so, how do we move past? And maybe this is something food for thought, and may not be answered right away. But how do we move past 
the activism, which is large, which is a huge impact, but how then do we, d does it move to an action of policies have been changed, enacted when it comes to NHIF? I read the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto. It's a sh page 56. A small portion of it addresses people with disabilities. I'm glad he was on there. But what, what else can we do to amplify and really make meaningful change when it comes to um, equity of, of people with disabilities? I'm just going to pause there. But thank you so much. This has been, we need to have this once a quarter, if it's not too much. And, and kind of, <laughs> right? <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Ressa, would you like to speak to that? Can I say something about that? Uh, please. Uh, so this is Samuel Odao from Mombasa, Kenya. Um, I'm one of the contributors to the book, and I'm happy that uh, we're having this session today. I, I think the question that the lady raises, um, I'll connect that to also one that was raised by Alan, as well as the question on the relationship between scholarly work or academia and and, and activism. One of the conflicts or some kind of awkward moment that existed between myself and, and my lecturer in the UK when I went there, I'm totally blind. And so we were reviewing the documents from Kenya. And there's this issue that came up that, okay, in Kenya, persons with disabilities have got free legal aid. And I knew at that point in time, as a person with disability from Kenya and a blind person, that that information was false. But my lecturer would have none of it because he has read it in the book. It is written in the Kenyan report. And so he thought, because it is written, then it is okay, it is true. And so after that discussion, when I came back to Kenya, the first thing I did is to start a research firm because I believe that research will influence advocacy. Research informs advocacy. And just like the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, require, provides that um, government in working with persons with disabilities should work with them using, I mean, through their, their, their organizations, organizations of and for persons with disabilities. I would recommend the same for the academia because we write and we frame a lot of issues but not all activists are able to interact with that which we write. And therefore to break, uh, to, uh, to, to kind of bring some nexus between the academia and, uh, and, and activism, and particularly organizations of persons with disabilities who are often used by NGOs um, to advance certain issues, be it in healthcare or education, is that we can try and reach out to them, maybe through seminars and through mentorship like I do, so that then they're able to understand not only the new trajectories in the disability sector, but also that which is being pursued globally. And I give an example. I was a board member of the National Council for Persons with Disabilities. Now that is the government agency in charge of um, promoting disability inclusion in Kenya. And sometimes you'd hear persons with disabilities say, for this kind of organization that is mandated by government to serve us, we want all its officers to be persons with disabilities, or most of its officers to be persons with disabilities. And then I ask them, okay, fine. So granted, let's have all of them as persons with disabilities. Will we still be promoting disability inclusion? Because then what will happen is that if you go to another entity, you'll be told, go to your institution where you are taken care of. And that is not the desire of the quest for disability inclusion. Number two, I would say that uh, for, for we to move forward, Paddy has mentioned something important, a public interest litigation. And I think that is an area that US has really perfected, particularly in the disability sector. I think we need to encourage more of, of, of that so that uh, in the event that the, the government blatantly offends the law with regard to disability, action is taken. And action is taken through going to court. The, the reason why most organizations of persons with disabilities cannot go to court is because they lack the legal fee. They are the capacity to pay the legal fee. And that is now where we can look at how then can public interest litigation be financed. 
And of course, the next thing I would say, and the last thing, is when it comes to mentorship of young persons, uh, young advocates with disabilities. Some of us who've been in this field for some time can take up mentorship of, 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 of these young advocates who are coming up so that they not only get the history, but they also understand the gaps that exist. Much as there are things that have been achieved, but there's still a lot of glaring gaps, which when they understand, they can then use the momentum to push it forward. I think the most important thing that I'm, is coming out here in my discussion is that uh, <clears throat> disability inclusion uh, is not uh, an end in and of itself. It's a process. Uh, and so it's something that has to be continuous. And in doing so, the academia must pull together and join hands with the advocates, with the ad activism, particularly the organizations of persons with disabilities and for persons with disabilities for better results. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Odao. We have uh, Alan is up next, and then we'll hear from Javier uh, Nyango and then Dr. Ressa. Alan? All right. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very, uh, very much, Samuel. And uh, I do agree with you that mentorship uh, shall uh, be a great deal in terms of uh, uh, creating a bridge between uh, the new or younger generation of advocates and those who have existed in the industry for the longest time. Uh, I speak from uh, a point of uh, having traveled back from the United States a week ago and uh, uh, with one of the things that uh, I noticed and uh, which the room might be aware of, or even as the book puts it so rightly, uh, Kenya, we are so ahead in terms of uh, our, our, uh, legislation on how persons with disabilities should be included, but then we fall back on implementation and uh, evaluation. And I think if uh, the scholars who are here could also get to study why that is the case, then we'll be also, I think it will be, and it will uh, enable our organizations to, to look at, probably the issue is not legislation, the issue is uh, implementation and evaluation. And if we start looking at that very keenly, then probably uh, gradually we'll be heading where we want to, to see disability inclusion in our country. But also I would like to piggyback on, uh, uh, on uh, the utilization of media as a tool for advocacy. And uh, when I participated in the professional fellows program, uh, which uh, culminated in uh, a week, about a week ago, uh, my proposition is how can we use new forms of media? And uh, uh, when I talk about new forms of media, I'm looking at mobile journalism and citizen-based journalism. How can we train persons with disabilities and give them this tools and information and then also train them on how to use social media as uh, tools for publishing the, the information and the content that they are creating then we'll be able to 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 enhance civic engagement and participation for persons with disabilities because i do agree uh, uh with the professor who teaches uh, disability uh, studies in the united states and uh, and here and he does research here in kenya unfortunately I did not catch the name right yes persons with disabilities are using social media particularly facebook here in the country but then when you sit down and scrutinize how they are using it it's more of uh, pulling back and forth without having a proper agenda and without understanding what they can be really putting ahead to influence uh, probably a decision making. No, I apologize for cutting in. I'm really concerned. We have two other people that, that would like to speak and we've got about three minutes left. So I appreciate your contribution. That was Dr. Theo Ressa, by the way, that you were, uh, whose name you did not catch. Uh, Ms. Ranyango, would you, would you uh, uh, care to speak? Thank you very much. I, I, I just want to add uh, two things uh, from since that publication, and that is that uh, more and more I'm beginning to see that disability inclusion in Kenya and activism as a movement is becoming multidirectional because then you have specific categories of diverse disabilities. Uh, moving on their own track. But then at the end, they meet at the apex of the global um, goal for inclusion of persons with disabilities. So that, that is something that needs to be looked at, this uh, multidirectional 
uh, transition. Then number two, uh, just to emphasize on what Musi uh, Kiari uh, mentioned about the nexus between uh, activism and academia. Now, my experience is that, uh, yes, there is a huge body of intellectual knowledge, research, lying in the archives and libraries of the university. Now, for us to succeed in, in, in having the Article 54 in the constitution, we have to go and do some, some work in the University of Nairobi Library. And there we found rationale for inclusion of persons, which we then presented at the National Conference of Constitution. So what I'm seeing moving forward is that um, the academia and scholarly work gives the disability movement evidence-based approach to activism uh, so that uh, you back your activism with, with critical scientific empirical evidence from the academia. And that is the nexus that I want us to, uh, to explore further uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to Okay, so, so uh, when it comes to um, disability rights movement, uh, there are generally four categories of people with disabilities. We have an activist, self advocate, an advocate, and an ally. So I, I'm just referencing to recent election in Kenya uh, in August. So we find that the 15 uh, government ministers that were uh, almost 15 government ministers, actually, they are richer than most of the US New York uh, representatives or uh, Joe, Joe Biden uh, representatives. Yet New York alone has $1.2 trillion more than Kenya's one billion dollars. So there is irony here in that we have a lot of work in few people's hands in Kenya, which is actually causing more problems to majority of people. So that's why we need a bottom-up activism. And few disabled people who are in government, especially, I, I, I'm very much afraid that we are creating an elitist group in Kenya, in that we have few disabled empowered people at the expense of the majority at the paradigm below. So we need those kind of activity, bottom up activity. Thank you, Dr. So I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Montalion. And I'm just going to very quickly close out. I just want to briefly mention before we leave, there are several other authors who are in the audience today. Um, so I see Colin Frederick Omanke, um, Samuel O'Dowell, who spoke during the Q&A, and then make sure, uh, Love and Matt Rooney as well. And so I, I want to thank everyone who was here today um, at this really rich conversation. Uh, please do purchase the book. Thank you all. Should I address the question in the chat? The recording will be available on the website for the University of Toledo Disability Studies Program in the next week. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you all. I'm going to turn off the Zoom now.